Hi, everyone. Uh, this is the Broad Universe Literary Coalition. We are here tonight with five of our members uh, who will be reading for you from their works. Broad Universe is an international nonprofit association dedicated to supporting women and alternatively gendered writers of speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. So tonight we have a literary sampler for you of a variety of stories. So settle back, you're gonna hear us read in order. Each author is gonna have nine minutes to introduce themselves and read. And hopefully you'll find your new next favorite read with us. So tonight, the first reader is Randy Dawn. Randy? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Randy Dawn, and I am a journalist by day and a uh, an fiction writer by the evening. Sometimes those two things blend, but basically I, I do entertainment journalism, and I also write speculative fiction, sometimes of the dark variety, sometimes of the hopefully humorous variety. And it's the latter I want to share with you tonight. Um, this is my website if you are interested, and there'll be a little thing at the end of the story if you go here and reach out to me um, on the contact, I will have a little bonus for you at the end of the story, so you can decide if you want to do that. My story tonight is called Ghost Balls, a love story and a recipe with nuts by Randy Dawn. Francis nearly made it out alive. Alas, walk-in freezers are notoriously bad at preserving living meat. Signore Antonioni, owner of the legendary Italian bistro Antonioni's, had a particular peculiar belief about his restaurant food stocks, namely that if it could be frozen, it should be frozen. He bought pounds of premium product from pork chops to pancetta, and all of it went into storage in the deep freeze. Prep cook Francis had but one item that he wanted to purloin, though, Antonioni's prime pecans. Grown by methods known only to the Antonioni family for generations, though some said the family's proximity to the local nu nuclear waste dump was a factor, the restaurateur grew nuts the size of a man's thumb, and he was a proud papa to each and every one. People consumed his pecan-strewn dishes and left positively glowing. Freezing them seemed dubious, but Francis didn't care if Antonioni was right or if he was nuts. It was Francis's third anniversary with darling Emmeline, and he was going to make her favorite chopped pecan cookies, which they both jokingly called ghost balls, thanks to the powdered sugar that coated them. With the only best nuts come hell or high water. Unfortunately, what came was hell and frozen water. Having sneaked into the restaurant after closing hours, Francis jerked open the walk-in freezer and strode inside. He'd barely laid his hand on a pouch of the precious pecans, perched directly next to pork chops in Signore, in Signore Antonioni's alphabetized system when the freezer door slammed shut on him. The light cut out because deceased meats and cooled nuts do not need to see in the dark. Still clutching the purloined pecan pouch in one hand, Francis scrabbled for his phone, but there was no signal. Next, he launched himself at the door, pounding until he could barely feel his hands. He grabbed some pork chops to hammer away in his stead. No one came. Signore Antonioni's closed at midnight, and Francis had entered the freezer at 12.11, having left his adoring Emmeline snoozing away in the tiny flat they shared. Alone and desperate, Francis did what he could. He stomped up and down the freezer, refusing to give in to the cold, insisting he could survive until the bakers arrived at dawn to make the bread. They would find him then. All he had to do was think of sweet Emmeline, her curly dark locks splayed out on the pillow. Every time he thought of her, he typed out another text message of love, sharing his plans for their anniversary, but without a signal they couldn't be sent. They remained drafts, stored up and ready for delivery, as frozen as the meats around them. Around four, Francis faltered. It was a miracle he hadn't frozen already. He knew he wasn't doing well. After the first hour, he'd lost sensation in his toes, then his ears, then the tip of his nose. His fingers went last, since he'd been keeping them warm and ready to text beneath his armpits. But a deep inner cold stole into him, and soon he had a hard time thinking. By 4.30 in the morning, Francis had walked several miles in the frozen chamber. He felt he'd run a marathon. He only had to hold out a little longer. And then his foot went wrong, 
landed atop a chop he'd dropped earlier. Francis went flying. The pecan pouch flew with him. Francis landed first, thwacking his head on the concrete. The frozen pecans crashed into his skull and scattered. Francis was out for the count. And another 20 minutes later, he was as dead as the meat surrounding him. When they found him, frozen pecans had stuck to his exposed skin like giant warts. The haunting started the next day. Not in the restaurant, not in the kitchen, just in the walk-in freezer. The early arriving bakers first detected a distinct ooh-ing coming from the inside of the frozen room. Assuming it was a Freon leak, they called in Signore Antonioni, who opened the freezer to find every one of his precious pecans burst from their pouches, hovering in the fogging, foggy, swirling air. Ooh, came the voice in a tone that sounded suspiciously like Francis's nasal whine. Ooh. Now, Signore Antonioni did not put up with prankery. He hadn't scraped together every penny he'd earned running errands for ne'er do wells back in Palermo so that he could emigrate to America where he had to scrape all over again just to be able to finally open the finest Italian bistro the Washington DC suburbs had ever seen just to be cowed by a pathetic pecan poacher, dead, dead or alive or undead. He'd faced down much worse in the old country. Porca vaca. He swore into the empty freezer and the swirling, spooky pecans. I'm not scared of you, Frankie. They're going to bury your skinny little behind in the ground tomorrow, and that is going to be that. So tell me what you want, or find another restaurant to haunt. I got pasta to make. The swirling fog inside the freezer did a little dance, then coalesced into a vague approximation of the, of the late Francis's shape. Skinny, spike-haired, and slightly hunched over. Behind Signore Antonioni, the bakers crossed themselves and fled. Ooh, said the Francis Fogg. Ooh. You're repeating yourself, Frankie, said the pissed off owner. Spit it out. What do you want already? Pecan projectiles pinged from the freezer, bouncing off Signore Antonioni's chest. Eee, ghosted Francis. Mmm, lime. You want I should give her a bag of nuts? Ooh, che pale, Signore Antonioni swore again. And you'll go haunt somewhere else if I take a care of this? Ooh. Signore Antonioni was as good as his word. Following Francis's funeral, he delivered a whole box of the precious pecans to Emmeline's front door. Frankie wanted you to have these, he said. And I'm not going to make anything with poltergeisted pe pecans, so go nuts, lady. Also, my condolences. And he was gone. Emmeline, despite her grief, smiled. Earlier that morning, Francis's text messages had finally arrived on her phone, and everyone insisted how much he loved her, except for one. That one said simply, pulverize the pecans before putting them in the cookies. That afternoon, Emmeline set about making Francis's favorite cookies using the phenomenal pecans donated from his former boss. They were rich and sweet and beautiful and made perfectly round powdered sugar-coated balls. She stored them in a tall jar directly next to her bed for midnight snacking. And from then on, every time she prepared the recipe, she imagined she could hear her lost love calling to her in his nasal voice. Ooh, ooh, ee, muh, but she had to open up the freezer to hear him clearly. So thank you. Thank you. That's the end of the story, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if that got you curious about what ghost balls might taste like, uh, here's a little picture for you. They are seriously delicious. And if you drop me an email at randydawn.com, there's a contact form there, uh, and mention this reading, I'll add you to my mailing list and email you a copy of the recipe. So get, get signing up and it's all yours. And I'll pass you back now to Terry. Thanks so much. Thanks, Randy. That was awesome. I love that. <laughs> All right, our next reader tonight is Katherine Sullivan. Hi, I'm Katherine Sullivan. I write young adult, middle grade, science fiction and fantasy. And I'm going to be reading a short section from Talking to Trees, which is supposedly coming out this year, uh, hopefully. And I've got a connected short story later on in another reading. So, and starting off with these characters, Jody is 13. Uh, the other characters, well, their age is a little different. Jody froze as she heard the strange roar overhead. Twill pushed her to the ground and followed right behind. Jody looked back at her indignantly. 
Will you stop pushing me? A brown winged shape passed over their heads and crashed into the thick undergrowth beyond them. Jody screamed. She had had a brief impression of big wings and sharp claws in the rush of wind as the thing had flown overhead, and now it was on the ground near them. Twill climbed to her feet, watching the waiting brush. The bushes growled. The growl turned into whippers. Ow, 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 ow. Jody stopped screaming. That sounded like a boy. Ow, said the bushes again. A cute boy, Jody decided. She pushed herself up and hurried toward the bushes. We've got to help him, Jody said. Although she wasn't sure what they could do against that winged thing, she wondered where the cute boy had been hiding. Had he been following them? Twill followed her as they eased through the broken tree limbs and crossed vegetation. Jody stopped and stared. Tangled in fallen branches were a giant eagle and a mountain lion, but it was only one animal. The front half looked like a white eagle. It struggled against the branches pinning its brown dappled wings. The sharp yellow beak opened. Ow, it said in the cute boy's voice. Oh, Jody didn't think this big cat bird thing would have had time to eat the cute boy. Twill glanced at her and then approached the tangle. Are you all right? Twill asked. No, ow, I'm caught, ow. The bird head frowned at one huge outstretched wing pinned at a point out of reach of its talons. Here, let me help, Twill said. She started to move some of the branches. The cat back half of the creature awkwardly sat, its long spotted tail lashing among the leaves. What are you, Jody asked, yes, some kind of cat bird eco cheetah? The markings on the back legs did almost resemble those skinny cheetahs she'd seen on television. The bird had looked at her, pointed ears immersed from its feathers as the hook beaked open. I'm a griffin, he said, the ears vanishing again. What are you two? Twill filled, freed the trapped wing and the griffin retracted it with a pleased sound. He stretched out again to straighten the feathers with his beak. Onto a gullet, the girl said with a nod that made the beaded cords in her green hair rattle. Thank you, Twigallet, the griffin said politely. I'm Raffi. And I'm Jody. Jody was relieved to finally find someone with a short name, even if that someone did look kind of weird. The griffin looked, sniffed at her, and the ears pricked up through the golden-edged white feathers. I've never smelled anything like you before. Thank you. Jody tried to remember which perfume she was wearing today, and then realized she wasn't. Excuse me? She asked frostily. You smell green. Raffi's golden eyes widened. Of magic. The griffin sneezed explosively and backed away. Sorry. He sneezed again. Sorry. Magic affects me this way sometimes. He backed into a bush and batted at his beak with one bird-like foot. It twists my sister's tail when I interrupt her spells. Your sister? Twill asked. She's powerful enough to be a wizard, but Papa won't test her. He looked at them and his ears lowered. You, you haven't seen her, have you? She's much bigger than me, almost full grown. Bigger? Jody squeaked. Raffi looked pretty big to her. He's my height, she realized. The thought of a bigger griffin around somewhere was enough to make her skin creep. Oh, yes. I'm only six years old. Mama says I'm still growing into my feet. She says I'll be as big as her in another couple years. His head lowered. But Soraya will still be bigger. Jody glanced at Twill, but the other girl only looked thoughtful. We saw a griffin several days ago. It might have been she. That? Jody turned on Raffi. That was your sister? Why did she chase us into the forest? He cringed. I don't know. She was looking for wizards. Maybe she wanted to ask you directions. Yeah, right. Jody couldn't see anything that big needing help with directions. If she already knows magic, what's she looking for wizards for? Papa's too busy to train her. Mama said wait, but Sarai doesn't want to wait, so she flew away from home. Rafi studied his front feet. She wouldn't let me come with, but I followed her. Jody was surprised when Twill clapped her hands together. Maybe she's the one. The one what? The one to help us. Twill turned to Rafi. We need a wizard to help us. I could help, Rafi said shyly. I don't know as much as Sarai, but I'm going to learn magic. You sneeze when you're around magic, Jody commented. His ears drooped, but he didn't reply to that. He turned to Twill. What do you need help with? His politeness irritated Jody. There's a big mean monster threatening her grandmother, she said before Twill had the chance. A m monster? Raffi repeated. The skinny back half crouched. It is not a monster, Twill said sternly. She turned to Raffi. It is one of the old ones, one which hates all life. Sure sounds like a monster to me, Jody commented as Rafi's yellow eyes grew wide and his feathers flattened. And you want to fight one of those? Rafi hunched within his wings. We must, Twill said simply. Otherwise, it will destroy all the lands. 
Jody felt a cheer, chill suddenly. It was almost as if something was watching them. She looked at Twill, who had also become very still. Goosebumps ran up her arms. Raffi sneezed explosively. He sneezed again and again, and his wings almost lifted him off the ground. Sorry, he sniffled. Jody and Twill looked at each other. Jody giggled. How silly. She had almost scared herself. It was nonsense to think that anyone was watching them. Twill still looked worried. I did no magic, she whispered, and neither did you. So why is Raffi sneezing? Hay fever? Raffi's tail lashed. I have no fever. He patted past them and sniffed the air deeply. Then he shook his head. It is gone now. Twill looked even more worried. We must go as well, she said to Jody. Hey, we barely had a break, Jody protested. She followed Twill out of the tangled vegetation to the open spot where the griffin waited. Well, it was nice to meet you, Raffi. Raffi watched them wistfully. May I accompany you? Twill bobbed her head. You would be most welcome. Do you agree, Jody? Jody looked at Twill, but Twill was looking at her. What, it's my decision for a change? Jody asked. Twill wordlessly shrugged one shoulder, and Jody looked back at Raffi. Although the griffin was clumsy, he did have claws and a sharp beak. He could protect us. What about your sister? Raffi hung his head. I can't find her, but if you're looking for wizards as well, she may find us. Jordy wasn't sure she liked that idea, but Raffi would be with us, and he has such a cute voice. Sure, you can come with us, Raffi. The griffin's ears perked up, and there was a bounce to his step as he trotted beside her. As they passed the berry bush, he slowed enough to have several mouthfuls before quickly dashing after them. You're a vegetarian? Jody asked, feeling faintly relieved. At least she wouldn't have to worry about their new friend munching on them. Raffi looked wide-eyed at her and finished swallowing the berries. What's that? He looked back at the bush. I love sweets. Those are the best. Jody sighed and held out her bag. Here, there's more inside. Just don't eat my comb. Raffi's ears perked up as he reached out to take her bag. Then he sneezed suddenly and pulled back. You need to preen yourself, he said, shaking his head. It can't be good for you to have those growths in your pelt. Jody looked at her outstretched arm and shuddered. There were more leaves on her sleeve. If that is the other reason we need to find a healer, a wizard, Twill said, or perhaps a healer. Raffi looked from one to the other as he walked between them. This is a spell? He sneezed. Oh, yes, it's a spell. I thought it was a disguise. You mean you don't want to look alike? Of course not. Jody was indignant. You don't look alike. For one thing, her hair is green and mine is blonde. She pulled a portion forward to show him. Raffi tilted his head to one side. Looks green to me. Jody looked at the hair she held. It's green. My hair isn't supposed to Twill sighed. They were going to make you beautiful. Well, yeah, but they didn't say anything about turning my hair green. Twill looked as if she was about to say something. Then she turned to Raffi. Is there anything you can do? Raffi's ears flicked back and forth as he studied Jody. His beak reached out and gently plucked a leaf from her sleeve. He held it on his black tongue for a moment or two. Then he swallowed. Hmm. Well, Jody asked. Hmm. Raffi plucked a few more leaves. These taste good. That's it? Jody pulled her sleeve away. I should just prune myself? What about my hair? What about... She looked at her green stained palm and held in from his beak. This! Raffi sneezed. That is serious, he said, pushing her hand away with one talon foot. Do not call on that magic again. What magic? I will help you with your preening when we next rest. Those girls will be nice neck. Hey, Jody stopped and glared at him. I am not some type of salad bar. Raffi cringed and his ears lay flat. I'm sorry, did I offend? He looked back and forth between Jody and Twill. Oh, I'm a stranger. Only family members preen together. I'm sorry. Jody looked at Twill and suddenly realized what the griffin meant. We're not family. And if Peter were here, somehow she couldn't see him offering to pull the leaves off her. She'd have to do it herself. She looked down at her jacket and grimaced. This would take forever. Okay, Raffi, you can help if you want. Raffi clicked his beak, then he bounded away from them. Berries, he cried. And I think I will stop here. So this is upcoming republication of the talk Talking to Trees and be coming out from Zumaya Press at some point this year, I hope. And turning it back to Terry. Thanks, Catherine. Um, that was great. I was with Catherine at a reading on Thursday, and twice now she has left me in the middle of a story wanting more. Our next reader tonight is going to be Roberta Rogo. Hi. I am 
Uh, excuse me, I'm going to water myself. Uh. I am Roberta Rogo. I write mysteries. Uh, they are usually set in strange and unusual places. This is my newest book. It is called Lore and Disorder. And it is also from Zumaya Publications. And um, this is a detective story. The detective is named Paula Drach. And she is a independent, meaning private eye, in a city somewhere out there in the future that has been settled by humans. And uh, she is on a case. A small shopkeeper has disappeared. She's been hired by his wife to find out what happened to him. Um, she's found the body, but now she has to find out exactly what's going on. So she went to her favorite bar and picked up a friend named Basher Bob. And this is where we're going to start the scene. I didn't, I thought how I could phrase my next move. Basher and I go back quite a ways. Back when I was booted from the guards and I was first on my own, I got into something unpleasant and Basher got me out of it. We did a few rounds, decided it wouldn't work, left it at that. He's not one for domestics. So when someone comes to him with a family tip, he sends them to me. If I think a job will need more muscle than I care to give, I'll send the client to him. He's not all that clever, but he's a good man in a fight. And right now I was going into a fight. Basher, I said, I'm going to need some backup. Care to come along? Where to? Warehouses. Someone's putting the arm on the big shop franchisees, shaking them down, making them sell bad merch. Basher glowered at Tito, who was calling for another round. Anything to put a spike in his shoes. I was about to leave when I saw something that stopped me cold. Devon Delray came in, and right behind him were the two hard bodies who'd been following me around all day. I nodded toward them. Know who they are? Dasher gave them a once over. Seeing them on the waterfront, they're off a ship from the south. Uh, one of Kunin's, I think. They were on my tail all day, I said. I led them straight to the Assassin's Guild Hall. They're with Banker Delray, Basher observed. Bodyguards, I agreed. Now, why would a nice, respectable sort like Banker Delray suddenly sprout bodyguards, especially hard bodies off a Pankati ship? Care to ask them? Basher got off his stool. Not right now, I said. Since they're here, we'll go somewhere else and find out where the bad merch is coming from. Basher and I slid away from the bar, first me, then him. Separately, we strolled through the main room, joined forces again in the ante room, and went along the path beside the keys. We walked casually in the shadows, like two people who'd had too much brew and wanted to get rid of it quietly. I looked around, saw the big hard body, shrugged as if I didn't care, kept going, certain I could spot him by his footsteps. He was a heavy walker, big boots clonking on the slats of the docks. Various vessels were docked at the keys, ranging from small rowing boats to single-masted fishing smacks to the large cargo carriers from the southern settlements. Most of them just bobbed happily in the river with one or two sailors on watch while the rest of the crew spent their pay in places a lot less peaceful than Smokey Joe's. At the very end of the row was a good-sized two-master brig lit up with lanterns. A large male was on guard in the wharf next to the gangplank to make sure no one came too close. I nudged Basher. Note the crates on the docks, I said. I saw the same ones in the Trader Vic's shops I checked out today. I'd say we found the source of the bad merch. What are you doing here? Someone yelled from behind us. Did I say I wasn't stupid? I just made the worst mistake ever. 
Just because I could spot one hard body didn't mean his bedmate wasn't around. I turned around to face bodyguard Hanson. He was about my size, maybe a hair taller, but a lot more springy, the kind who does sit-ups and perhaps push-ups to build muscle. He swept his coat away from his hip to reveal a nice, sharp cutlass. The ship guard whistled. More males appeared from aboard the ship. Basher took a step behind me and turned to fend off the characters from the ship. I hefted my baton. Blade against wood isn't my favorite entertainment, but the nail heads on my baton gave me a sporting chance. It wasn't a fair fight, but it was a hard one. I got handsome on the shoulder, but it turned out he could still wield the blade with his other hand. I aimed for his ribs, he dodged, slashed, got me on the arm, mostly just ripped the sleeve of the jacket. I cursed under my breath. That jacket cost me five silvers. I gave him a boot in the shins and sent him staggering backwards. I followed that with a good swipe of the baton, but missed by inches. Handsome countered with another slash and stepped back right into the arms of city guard Thomas. I was never happier to see the guards than I was at that moment. Usually they stay far away from any street fighting until the bodies are all down. What's going on here, Tomas bellowed. Uh, we was just out for some air and these fellows jumped us, Basher declared, hefting his own bludgeon. Why would they do that? Tomas glared from us to the sailors. Mm, could be because they were uploading their ship, I nodded. I said, nodding to the crate still on deck. Trying to stiff the doctor's guild? Not paying import duty? Is that so? Thomas turned to his squad. Check this out, guards! They advanced on the ship. Basher and I faded back into the shadows to let the city guards do their duty, protecting the well-being of the city of and the book is called Lore and Disorder. And it is found on the uh, website of Zumaya Publications and at Amazon. And um, there is a second book that is at the moment in editing limbo. And I am writing the third. And I think that's all I have to say for now. Okay, Terry. Thanks, Roberta. And uh, I always love Roberta's readings uh, and her, her books. They're full of action um, and adventure. So definitely check those out. Our next reader tonight will be me, Terry Bruce. Um, I write hard to classify science fiction, fantasy, and horror. I'm kind of slipstream new weird, I guess, with a cross into literary fiction. Um, I have a series out the afterlife series consisting of three books um and i have a short story collection called souls uh that just launched in august this past year because um a pandemic is a great time to launch a book it turns out no um so i actually will probably be relaunching this year there'll be lots of um, parties and launch activities so if you like what you hear from me tonight you can go to my website terrybruce.net sign up to get on my mailing list and get notified of all my launch activities. Tonight, I'm gonna to be reading you a science fiction story uh, from Souls called uh, Before the Evolution Comes the Smoke. Um, this came out of my desire to write about uh, witches in space. Magda clutched the red satchel to her chest trying not to breathe in too deeply the stench of tightly packed bodies and vomit. If only she'd had the money to book a private transport to Orbital Station 6 instead of using the public courtesy shuttle. She breathed as shallowly as she could through her mouth as she looked around at the dozen or so other pinched and nervous faces, all apparently as overawed as she to be on their way to meet the witch face to face. From somewhere toward the back of the transport, the sound of retching continued. When she'd booked the ticket for Myatta and indicated she needed to rendezvous with the Orbital Station 6 shuttle, the chat box had, chat bot had typed back, pardon? 
She had never seen a technical script express surprise before. It transferred her to a video chat with a human agent who raised an eyebrow, speculation reflected in his dark eyes as the last of the credits in her account counted down one by one. When they checked her in at the transfer station and when she'd boarded the transport, the attendants had all looked at her the same way. Surprise, speculation, doubt. They'd all had the same question in their eyes. Why her? Why her wish? Of all the millions of petitions directed at Pisconarius, why had the great wizard of the deep chosen to grant her an audience? To board the shuttle, she'd waded through a crowd twenty deep, all of them wailing and beseeching. They'd grabbed at her arms, tried to latch onto her legs, thrust valuables and tins of food into her face. Please, I just need... Please, I'll be ruined! Please, my son is dying. That last one hurt because it was so close to her own situation. She jerked away and stumbled through the gauntlet, head down to avoid eye contact. She wasn't any more worthy than them. She'd just gotten lucky. No one knew how the witches decided which petitions to grant. Locked away in their orbiting stations, they toiled away, sifting through the requests, using unknown algorithms to accept or to deny. Those able to touch her as she passed through the jostling crowd had thrust Afuda-type charms into her pockets, the sleeves of her coat, into her shoes, any crevice they could find to lodge a scrap inscribed with their name. It was said that if the Afuda made it into the audience chamber, then the petitioner's wish would be granted a shortcut or loophole to the entire wretched crapshoot of requesting an audience with a witch. She had wanted to remove the Afuda. It hardly seemed fair for others to get free wishes after all she'd had gone through, but to throw them away seemed cruel or unsporting or some intangible that she couldn't quite put her finger on. She needn't have worried. All the little scraps had jostled loose and fallen by the wayside as she boarded the flight and buckled herself in. They drifted about the cabin now, looking strangely sad and powerless. The communication system crackled to life overhead, the pilot's voice over loud in the confines of the tiny passenger cabin. Ladies and gentlemen, we are preparing our final approach to Orbital Station 6. We should be docked within 30 minutes. Attendants, please complete final docking checks and secure the clamps. A bustle of activity followed this announcement as two attendants clad in yellow flight suits unhitched themselves from the wall and moved about checking harness fasteners, stowing free-floating items, and removing the puke bag from that one passenger in the back. Magda's stomach sloshed uneasily as she once more questioned her choice to ask Piscanarius for help. She'd really wanted Circe, but the chart said Circe wouldn't be in range for another hundred and fifty years. Magda would be long dead by then. John D., on the other hand, would enter IATA's system next year. Perhaps she should have waited for it. Magda shifted uncomfortably in her wall harness and fumbled in her breast pocket for a packet of antacids. She gulped down, too, to quiet her stomach. She wanted to blame the queasiness on the half-grav, but nerves were more likely the cause. Of the thirteen witches, Piscanarius was the most intimidating. Bit of a hard-ass with unpredictable results. In theory, they should all be the same. After all, they shared the same basic programming. However, everyone knew the witches each had quirks, peculiarities, and preferences. For instance, Holda hadn't summoned a demon for as long as anyone could remember. All petitions to it were greeted with the same response. Cannot request exclusive semaphores at interrupt time. Older folks would nod sagely when Holda's name was raised and say that this was because the AI agreed with them that humans shouldn't be messing around with demons. She tried Mawindo, which had passed through the IATA system eight years ago. Her petition had been summarily denied with the message, Fatal Error. She learned afterwards that this was always its response when solicited for anything other than wealth, property, or material goods. Those older folks who thought Holder was making a value judgment with its refusals didn't have much to say about an AI that prioritized material concerns over life and death. If Agrippa had disappeared 200 years ago, it would have entered the solar system before any of the others and might have agreed to help. It was rumored that, back in the day, it was rather liberal in granting petitions, though there were those who said Agrippa had agreed with Holda about not dealing with demons and had simply left populated space to put an end to petitions for its help. Others said that its home, Orbital Station 8, had been demolished by a rogue comet and the fragments now drifted aimlessly in the frozen reaches of space. Some said the acolytes had rebelled, 
refusing to recognize the authority and autonomy of the AI, and destroyed the computer with which they'd had an uneasy alliance as neither masters nor servants. Of another demon rampage, and it was a judgment, and Magda should stop talking about witches and demons before she called down bad luck on all of them, and then they would cross themselves, or spit over their shoulders, or tug a lock of hair, or make other signs that were supposed to ward off the all-seeing eye of whatever witch was in the system at the time. The communication system crackled to life again. Attendants, engage clamps and ready doors for debarkment. Magda clutched the red satchel tighter, hugging it to her like a child, reassured by the feel of the egg's boxy container pressing through the fabric against her stomach. With a final hollow clang that reverberated throughout the cabin, the transport came to a stomp. The alert sign overhead flashed, warning passengers not to disengage their harnesses, but all around her people ignored the instructions in a rising symphony of metallic clasps unhitching. Click, 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 click. She was jostled from the right and the left, and she clutched her bag tighter, fearing the precious cargo would be broken. She wondered what all these others had brought to Piscanarius. What had the witch demanded of them? Magda maneuvered out of her harness and queued up with the other passengers as they squeezed down the narrow aisle and through the even narrower airlock like toothpaste forced out of the tube. Once through the doorway, she had no time to pause and take in the orbiter's structure. She was pushed along by the flow of those exiting behind her down a gleaming white hallway barely wide enough to accommodate two people across. The procession was solemn and hushed, bathed in the glow of soft white lights. At the end of the hall, they passed to a door, and here, at last, the crowd thinned a bit as they entered a room big enough for them to spread out. Without people pressing her from all sides, Magda finally was able to take a deep breath for the first time since leaving Ayada. A group of acolytes glided forward to greet them all individually. Hers was young, in his twenties, with close-shaven hair. He wore the standard acolyte ensemble, brown service technician jumpsuit, black work boots, and a soft-sided repair kit strapped to his waist. Greetings, I am Darius. Hastily, she pulled open the bag and clumsily reached inside, fishing for the wine. She couldn't afford to screw this up. She didn't drink real alcohol, only synth. She couldn't afford antiquity such as that for herself, so she had no idea if this bottle would be acceptable. The automated merchant protocol had assured her it was top quality. What if it was wrong? What if she insulted the acolyte? Every step of the process was a test, a potential roadblock to her petition. If the acolyte didn't like the inducement, the traditional suggested gift of wine, she wouldn't be presented to the witch. She held the bottle out to Darius with a trembling hand. Darius smiled thinly and took it without even looking at the label, immediately passing the bottle to a pair of young acolytes in the green jumpsuits of novices who were circulating collecting the gifts. If you'll follow me... Magua in Magda inwardly sighed with relief. First hurdle passed. Darius turned left and proceeded to a doorway which led down another long, narrow, antiseptically white corridor. I, I brought the offering, she said breathlessly, her heart hammering. Darius nodded absently. The, she looked around furtively. The egg, she whispered. Good. The duck egg, she said, her voice rising. She quickly lowered it. Do you know how hard it was to get that? The only place to find ducks is Earth. You know, Earth. Darius made a non-committal noise. I committed three felonies to procure this thing. People can't just walk into a protected global wilderness and wildlife conservation area, you know. And even if you get in, it's not like they leave duck eggs just lying around. He didn't seem to know because his face still hadn't changed. I had to deal with criminals, she hissed. I had to bribe a conservationist and hire someone to smuggle it off Earth, and then I had to pay off the customs officials when I left Iada so they wouldn't look in my bag. Not to mention the things she'd done to earn all that money, and she still had no idea if the offering would meet Piscanarius' approval. If you want to find out if Magda gets her wish and what happens when she meets the witch, then you will have to buy a copy of Souls. This is available in ebook and paperback wherever books are sold. All right, and our last reader tonight will be uh, L.J. Cohen. Hi, folks. Terry, that was really unfair of you. I have to get that so I can read the end of the story now. 
So my name is LJ Cohen. I write science fiction and fantasy novels primarily, although I also do some short stories. Um, I am a retired physical therapist, and so right now I try to use my powers for uh, he uh, hurting and healing characters in my novels. I'm going to read an excerpt from Derelict, which is book one of a five-book science fiction series. And about the only thing you know need to know to set this up is uh, contained in the brief blurb about the book, which I'll read to you. When Rosalind Maldonado tinkers with the derelict freighter, she's just hoping to prove she deserves a scholarship to university. She certainly doesn't count on waking the ship's damaged AI or having three stowaways, Micah Rotherwood and brothers Jem and Bear Durbin, along for the ride. They all have their private reasons for hiding aboard, aboard and lives they are seeking to escape, but if the accidental crew can't work together and learn to trust each other, they'll die together, victims of a computer that doesn't realize the war ended decades before any of them were ever born. Red light continued to stutter through the bridge. In the silence, Ro could hear all of her involuntary crew breathing too fast and too hard. It was easy to visualize them turning all the available oxygen into carbon dioxide. At least it made for a painless death. She glanced up at Bear and winced at the worry she read in his face. Even if she were good at the whole reassurance thing, she'd be lying if she told them Jem would be all right. There were more ways for them to die than survive. Jem knew it. She wondered if Micah and Bear did, too. Ro wrote across her micro and held it up for the two of them to see. Brace yourselves. Not waiting for their acknowledgement, she turned to Jem's elegant program. Damn, but that kid could code. There was really no way she could strap him in anywhere. She wedged herself against the command console, wincing as her foot twisted. If the ship accelerated again, they would all be flung around the room and things would get a lot worse. But there was no help for that. She triggered Jem's interface override. The screen scrolled up, all the code vanishing, replaced by a single blinking old school cursor. Ro held her breath as she typed in what she hoped would let the, her access the AI's core. The seconds stretched out. Respond, come on, come on, respond, she urged silently, setting the micro on her pants and wiping her damp hands across the thin fabric. Words typed themselves across the small screen. Siren, version 1.7b, initializing. Ro exhaled and picked up the micro. The series of scrolling dots stopped, replaced by another waiting cursor. Except for the rustling of fabric and the whistle of harsh breathing, there wasn't another sound in the room. Her fingers flew across the tiny virtual keyboard in an effort to convince the dumb machine beneath the complex AI to reboot and suspend its damaged brain. There was no time to test her code. No time to even look it over for the most basic of errors. It just had to work. She finished, lifting her hands from the micro and let her head slump down to her chest, eyes closed. Ro? Micah's voice echoed in the metallic space. She ignored him. Ro! Snapping her head up, she glared at him. What? Look! The lights. The red emergency strobes stopped and a white diffuse glow brightened the room. A tentative smile spread across his face, making him seem younger and looking a lot less like his father. Ro took a welcome breath of air that tasted cool and crisp against her tongue. The hum of the air scrubbers filled her ears with a sound she swore never to take as given again. She met Micah's gaze but before turning to Bear and Jem, the strange relief making her oddly grateful to her accidental companions. 
Jem gave her a thumbs up, and Bear nodded before settling back down next to his brother. Well, nice to know we won't asphyxiate, Micah said. His expression had closed down again. We'll just die of starvation, or boredom. I know, maybe if we're lucky, we'll be hit by an asteroid. So much for the Roe Maldonado fan club, she thought. What's your next brilliant plan, he asked, or do we wait here for a tow? You're welcome, she said. Jem, come on, you have to stay awake. Bear leaned over his brother and lifted a closed eyelid. What's the matter, Roe asked, scooting closer to them. Closed head injury. I have no way of knowing how bad the damage is. Bear stared directly into her eyes. He didn't have to say the no thanks to you part. He needs a head scan, fluids, probably a sedative if he gets restless and confused, and that means getting back to Daedalus. Ro glanced up at the viewport and the unmoving and unfamiliar star field. We need the AI to navigate. Should have thought of that before you started fucking with the ship, Micah said, his voice ringing across the bridge from where he stood, leaning against the bulkhead, his arms crossed. You weren't supposed to be here, any of you. It was hard to feel any kind of moral authority when Roe had to look up at him from the floor. You couldn't leave well enough alone, Micah shouted, even after I told you about your father's smuggling operation. My father? What about your father? Do you think those diplomatic seals just faked themselves? Micah's face burned bright red against his blonde hair. This is your fault. You could have helped me ground the ship and their cargo. Tell Commander Mendez all about it. But no, you had to be smarter than everyone else. That's enough. Jem's soft croak commanded all their attention. Don't you dare try to get up, Bear said, his hand on the center of his brother's chest, holding him down. Jem stopped struggling and closed his eyes. Fine, but my head hurts enough without all of you screaming at each other. At least we have air. Ro will think of something. Even after everything, Jem had this blind, stubborn faith in her. If he already wasn't in such bad shape, she would shake some sense into him. I don't know what to do, she winced, admitting her own helplessness. We can't get home until we figure out where the hell we are. We can't get any sort of nav fix without the AI, and it's fried. Well, thank you, Dr. Obvious, Micah said. Doctor? They didn't have a doctor, but the ship had a medical bay. She grabbed Jem's micro and pulled up his copy of the ship's schematics, circling the infirmary. Take this, she said, holding out the little computer to Micah and pointing out where he needed to go. Inventory the medical bay. Text me what you find. I need to know what supplies are still there. The if any, she kept to herself. Why me? You know your way around biologicals and test equipment. She wasn't at all sure Bear would leave his brother, and even if he would, Ro didn't want to deal with Micah. She pointed to her ankle, and I'm grounded for the time being. Micah held her gaze for a long minute, as if looking for the right words to start up the fight with her again. Then he pushed away from the bulkhead and strode out of the bridge. My brother seems to trust you, Bear said. Ro shrugged. For all of our sakes, I hope he's right. So that's the segment from this book that I'll read. Um, and if anybody who's seeing this wants to uh, email me uh, through my website, which you'll see a link to, uh, first five people who email me, I will send them the ebook of this for free. Thanks. That, that was awesome, LJ. Um, and uh, that was a good closing piece. Um, but you also were cruel and left us on a cliffhanger rude um so thanks everyone for watching um this has been a, a smattering of the talent that is within broad universe um as i said at the beginning broad universe is an international nonprofit supporting women and alternatively gender gendered writers of science fiction fantasy and horror if you want to learn more about broad universe or perhaps join us 
then you can visit our website at broaduniverse.org. I uh, hope you'll check out the websites of all the various authors that read tonight um, and engage in their giveaways, get copies of these fabulous books. And um, I want to thank the MarsCon committee for having us and allowing us to participate in MarsCon. And MarsCon is going all weekend long, so there's still more programming today. In fact, I think there's a Chicon party um, starting, I think, at uh, 8 p.m. Central. I'm heading over there myself. And uh, there's more programming tomorrow on Sunday as well. So you can check uh, the MarsCon website to see the entire list of programming and check out uh, their Discord server where lots of conversation is happening as well. Um, and there also is a charity auction. Um, so head over there, check that out. And I've heard that there are Girl Scout cookies for sale, which is really dangerous. Um, so please somebody buy all of those so that I don't buy any. <laughs> Get them away from me quickly. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes. I don't know if there were any questions. So it looks like um, if yeah. anybody out there is listening still and has a question for us, we do have a couple of minutes and we can answer your question. Um, Otherwise, we will see you in the real world, hopefully soon. Getting closer. Getting exactly. closer. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, yeah. Mars Khan. Yeah. Thank you, fellow readers. Thank you, whoever is watching us. <laughs> thank if you, anybody, people. Thank anybody you wants for coming. To, anybody wants to reiterate their giveaways super quick? Who's doing giveaways? Sure. Uh, oh, uh, go ahead, Brandy. That's well, fine. It's been so long since they heard me. They need to hear me again. It's been an hour. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go here. Go to the contact uh, the contact page. Uh, write to me and tell me you came to this reading, and I will send you the recipe for these ghost balls. Uh, and I'll put you on my mailing list. Uh, and if you go to ljcohen.net and there's a contact, you can send me an email. And if you tell me you heard my reading, I will send the first five people an ebook of derelict in their ebook version of choice. And I don't have a giveaway at this um, con, but if you do go to my website, um, I will be having all kinds of release parties and giveaways and things um, happening for the relaunch of souls. So sign up to follow me. Um, and I will be participating in some more readings this month as well, where there may be giveaways. So cool. follow me around. Uh, you may be able to get a copy of a free book. And I don't have a giveaway, but on the Zumaya website, which is zumayapublications.com, um, one of my previous series is having a box special, which is an ebook. And I have several previous series on Amazon as ebooks. So you can go and check those out. And I will also be singing at various conventions coming up in the next few months. And Laura Willing and the sun rises finally. <laughs> uh, once we get out of this mess, I will be talking. I've got another reading later on tonight and a panel at 10 o'clock on world building and a panel tomorrow morning on cut the boring parts. <laughs> yeah, those both looked really good. I'm going to try to stay awake for the one tonight. I'm on the East Coast, so it's a little harder for me. And um, but yeah, the one tomorrow looks good, too. So if you're a writer, check out Catherine's panel. Well, thanks again, Mars Khan and Terry for hosting. And we yeah. will see you uh, IRL, hopefully, in the future and um, online in the, in the present. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha, for being our tech person. <laughs> Thank you for always doing a wonderful job, Natasha. <laughs>